there are plenty of academics that have the intellectual chops of C.S. Lewis and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but they have not the impact because they're cowards. It's yeah. because what we see in the academy is that the the you see that we're utter cowards. They will not speak up about the Lord. They will not take a, a defensive position to defend the faith. And you see they did this in Nazi Germany. They did yeah. this with the Soviets. They went yeah. right along with the government because they wanted to hunker down thinking it wasn't going to affect them. They wanted to get their accolades. They wanted to get their awards yeah. because what happens is in the sciences, and I, and I know this firsthand, they exclude you from the academies. They exclude you from awards. And so people don't want to speak up. I have people coming to me saying they watch the videos on Origin of Life. They say, Jim, you had everything, everything right. Yeah. We agree with you, but don't tell them. Don't use my name. Welcome to the Science and Faith podcast with Dr. James Tour. I'm Dr. James Tour, and I'll be your host. And uh, you can see my professional credentials at jmtour.com, or you can see my social media site at drjamestour.org. And this podcast is being, being aided with my producer, Eric Heron of philosopherfilms.com. And uh, I'm a practicing scientist. I love science, but I love Jesus more than anything else. And uh, if you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is only for people that do not believe this and you want to hear why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can send me an email to tour at drjamestour.org and I'll be glad to set up a session with you by Zoom and, and uh, I'll tell you why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And with that backdrop, let me introduce to you our, our uh, uh, guest for today. It's Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, welcome, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. I got to tell you something, Dr. Tour. Um, it, it's so important, I think, for people to realize that it is reasonable to believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, yet still uh, be able to explore science as a scientist. I think a lot of young people think these are two mutually exclusive no notions. You can do one or the other, but you can't do both, can you? And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Let me tell some of our, and let me tell our guests something about you. So Jay Warner Wallace, who goes by Jim, is an NBC Dateline featured cold case homicide detector, detective, and he's a, a popular uh, a speaker, and he travels all over in speaking. He's, uh, he's part of uh, Talbot School of Theolo Theology, which is uh, uh, part of Biola University, Southern Evangelical Seminary. And uh, he serves as a senior fellow at the Colson Center for uh, the Christian Worldview. Uh, he, he's done a lot of writing. He has several, several popular books. Uh, Cold Case Christianity is probably the one he's best known for. Uh, but he's also done a lot of TV work and solved a lot of crimes, cold cases, that things where there's, there's no body, there, there's no body left, there's no, no witnesses, and he's able to, to, to find the killers and, and, and get them prosecuted. So uh, just really good to have you here today, Jim. Well, I'm glad to be with you. It's been a fun watching your career as well. We got a chance to meet, if you remember, at a conference oh, I did I in Texas. And I thought at the time I, I knew about you. And somebody mentioned, oh, did you know there's a guy named Dr. James Tour is going to be in the audience? I, I'm like, are you kidding me? I, I know who that is. And so they brought you back backstage so I could meet, just because I wanted to meet you. Yeah, uh, and yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, you're in my book. You're in the chapter on science. Um, so there's, there, there's a drawing in which you're part of the collection of scientists in the current generation that are Christ followers who are making a huge impact on science, the kind of like the all-star hall of fame of scientists. So I'm just glad to get a chance to do this with you today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I just want you to know, I got a copy of your book and, uh, um, and I've, I've read this twice now I read it. And, and so I'll tell you on the first sitting I read this book in 24 hours, in under 24 hours, and that was still going about my normal day. It wasn't like I had a, a full day off. I mean, so it is a real page turner. Once you get started, you're like, wow, I didn't know this. So I learned a ton from your book, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about sure. this. I'm so glad. All right. All right. So so tell us, when, when you say that uh, uh, you can 
you can uh, uh, prove the existence of Jesus and his life and his teachings, even if you didn't have the New Testament. What on earth do you mean? Well, okay, so I imagine this thought experiment where some evil future regime has destroyed every New Testament and been successful. So now there is no New Testament manuscript anywhere. There's no printed New Testament. All of these things have been utterly destroyed and removed from, from the face of the planet. Well, what could you, would that be enough in and of itself to eradicate Jesus from human history? Is it possible that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, had the kind of impact that was so deeply entrenched that his fingerprints remain to this day and that the story of Jesus could be completely reconstructed from the most unlikely corners and nooks and crannies of human culture? Well, it turns out that that's the kind of impact that Jesus had. So when we're looking at that, we're trying to say, well, look, is, is, why would this guy have that kind of impact? And what's the level of his impact? And to what degree can the story of Jesus be reconstructed from that impact? That's what we're trying to do in this book. Because I think one of the questions that I used to get from a lot of college students in college campuses when we do talks there was, okay, look, so if Jesus is God, wouldn't you expect there to be more than just these four obscure little gospels in the first set? Well, it turns out. Yeah, I would expect more. I'd expect there to be a huge ripple effect on history if Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. But did you realize that there is that huge impact? And I think for a lot of our young people, um, we're just not being taught anymore about the impact of Jesus. As a matter of fact, you know, aside from a few of you who are doing science publicly, uh, a lot of historic scientists, if you look at their biographies, their religious identity has been completely scrubbed. So you would not, not know if they were believers in anything based on the historical record anymore, when in fact, these were not just uh, believers. They were Christian believers, Christ followers, who wrote deeply about Jesus in their personal diet, in their personal journals, in their letters to each other, in books they even wrote about Jesus, yet you wouldn't know it from the public history we have. So that's what this book tries, tries to do, is to kind of restore some of that. Right. And, and so in this book, Person of Interest, um, you start with this, and, and, and again, I didn't know any of this. So you think I'd know this, I didn't know any of it. You start with, with what you call uh, uh, the cultural fuse, Jesus the average ancient. And you talk about writing, the alphabet, Greek, transportation, roads, uh, toleration of religion. Why was, t tell me how, how this was the perfect time for Jesus to have come based on these cultural features. Yeah, when we investigate no body murders, we don't have any evidence from the crime scene. This guy kills his wife. He says that she ran away. He, just, he successfully destroys her body. And then we're like, okay, well, I don't have a crime scene. I don't have a body. 30 years later, there's not a single piece of property booked into evidence. I got nothing. How do I make a case like that? Well, we tell the jury that on the day that, that this, this person vanished, if this is a murder, that was a bomb that was detonated. But that bomb had a fuse that burned slowly to the detonation. And after it explodes, there's trap null and debris everywhere. So we're going to make the case to the jury from basically just the fuse and the fallout of the timeline. Well, the same thing can be done for Jesus, even if there was no evidence from the New Testament, the fuse and fallout would be enough. And one aspect of that fuse is just the culture of empires, the history and the rise and fall of empires and governments that lead up to what we now call the first century. It wasn't always called the first century. As a matter of fact, it wasn't the first century. Why are we calling it that? Well, because something, something, a bomb went off in that period of history that initiated the common era. And so the question is, what is the fuse that's burning up to this? Well, one of those fuses is cultural. It is the fact that the Roman Empire sets into place and leverages a series of events that occur before the Roman Empire that then make for the appearance of Jesus to have an explosive reaction culturally. In other words, uh, you know, the Roman Empire leveraged the Etruscan alphabet, made it common to the empire, which was the largest governed body of an, on the entire planet of, of lands, of nations, of people groups that were all part of the Roman Empire. Now they were sharing the Etruscan alphabet. They were speaking uh, Koine Greek, uh, a, 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 a spoken Greek language. They were using technology by this time on papyrus. You know, if you were writing with pictographs on clay, 
thousand years earlier, you're going to have a hard time communicating, for example, the Sermon of the Mount with just pictographs, and it won't travel well if it's on fragile clay or in carved in stone. So it turns out having a, an alphabet that can be writ written on a papyrus is a huge advantage. But the Romans even had a period of time in which they controlled so much that they were quelling all of the wars that had been very, very much a part of, of human history prior to the Roman Empire. This is called the Pax Romana, a 200-year period of peace. And in that period of peace, the money that you would typically spend for wars, you are now building infrastructure with it. So more roads, tunnels, bridges were built during this period, the same roads and tunnels and bridges that Paul walked to spread the gospel in the first century. Those roads weren't even available, many of them, to Paul until the Romans put those roads in place. So it turns out the timing of that fuse that opens up a window of peace in which the infrastructure is now in place, even a postal service. Uh, these are the kinds of things that were then used by people within the empire to communicate the truth of what Jesus did and said. But that wasn't available even 500 years earlier. That's a window of opportunity that comes really during the Pax Romana. And so that's what we're trying to do in the book is to show how when Paul says in Galatians that Jesus, that God sent his son in the fullness of time, what does that mean? Well, this is part of what it means. Mm. And, and, this is great. I was just visiting a Bible museum and, and the curator of that museum was my host and she was showing me through this. And I said to her, did you know that, that this had to be the perfect time because now they had paper, they could begin to write on these parchments, they could begin to, to write on these and transfer this and it wasn't brittle and it was the perfect time. And I learned all this from your book and she thought I, I, I knew so much, but I just read one book. <laughs> <laughs> How about, about the, the, the toleration of, of religion? How, how did that play into this cultural? Yeah, if you society? actually, if you just did a search of all the wars between people groups prior to the Roman Empire, you'll be amazed at how often humans were in the business of killing other humans. And when they would do that, they often had little or no tolerance for their culture, for their religious system. So like, like a group would come in, if they just, if they conquered you, they would basically annihilate all of the people who believe certain things. And all those myths would then be van vanished, uh, vanquished from the kingdom. And off you go to the next uh, set of history. Well, the Romans uh, were wise enough to know that as they conquered these different people groups, it would be wise, at least initially, to allow these people groups to retain some of their culture, including the gods they worshipped. As a matter of fact, the Romans were pretty pluralistic about this. They had no problem even embracing some of the gods of other people groups. They would just change the names. Um, this, this would happen within the Roman Empire, at least initially. Now, the only, of course, the only uh, rub was that they expected these people groups then to bend their knee to the Roman pantheon of gods. And it wasn't really until they were, it was clear to them that the Christians wouldn't do that, that Christianity faced the kind of persecution it ultimately did. But that initial kind of that view of religious tolerance that would allow each conquered group to retain their gods did work in our favor in the earliest days of the Christian movement. So again, it's just because you happen to be in this kind of setting with this kind of empire that has this kind of technology and this kind of an approach toward conquered people groups that really set the stage for the blossoming of Christianity. Yeah, that's that that that, that was all new to me. And it 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 just really struck me that this and, and we're gonna see a thread as as I just run down through your book, the the, the perfect timing of God, the perfect timing of for Jesus' coming. And so you say it's also the 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 it's the right time spiritually. The expectations are right. You have this, this chapter, Jesus, the copycat savior. Why was this the right time spiritually and th this whole idea of expectations? And you actually gave an example in your book of when you were, you were, you were, you were not in uniform. You were dressed like, uh, I don't know, you had long hair or something. And, and the expectations were wrong. And so you couldn't even get information from, from the person reporting the crime. 
Yeah, it turns out that when the expector meets the ex, uh, when the expected rather meets the expectations of the expectors, you get a better result. This is also true for pretty much anything. If you expect a restaurant to be really good and you get there, it's okay, but it's not really good. Well, then your expectations are now cause you to have a you know less satisfaction than you would have if you had very low expectations to begin with. Well, it turns out that if you look at all of the myths of ancient people groups when they think about the nature of God, they create gods with certain sets of common expectations. You, for example, if you think that God is super powerful, you expect him to have superpowers. And uh, ancient myths, gods of ancient myths, do have miraculous ability to, to perform miracles, which why would you be surprised? That's the expectation of the ancients. You also will find that many of them share another commonality. They come into the world in um, a, an unexpected supernatural way. Of course, it's different depending on myth, but they all come in in unexpected supernatural natural ways. Many of them, for example, can defeat death. Well, I think you would kind of expect that if there's a God as well. Here's my point. A lot of these ancient mythologies resemble one another because the people groups have common expectations as humans designed in the image of God, even those who don't accept God, the God of Yahweh, of the, of the Jews. Well, you still are created in the image of God and you have certain common expectations as a result. Now, when you get to the time of Jesus, imagine if you were the God of the universe who wanted to leverage the common expectations of ancient people groups when they're thinking about God. This is what Paul is talking about on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. You people are pretty religious, but I'm here to tell you who the real God is because you've imagined certain things. He even quotes one of their poets, but these things are not actually true of God. It turns out that the ancient myths have about 15 commonalities that I've identified in the book. No one's got more than 10. No one myth has got more than 10 of these. No one myth I could find has less than six. But between six and 10 of these attributes, depending on the myth, and they're all different versions of those attributes, until you get to Jesus. And then with Jesus of Nazareth, only Jesus has all 15 expectations of the ancients embodied in one person. Why would God do it that way? Well, the story I use in the book is that, yeah, I was working undercover and I was simply trying to get a report from some uh, victim of a burglary. And I drove over my undercover car, jumped out because he had called for the police. But when I got there, I didn't look like the police and he would not pay attention to me until a patrol officer got there. He's wearing a uniform. He's in a patrol car. He met the expectations of the expector. And of course, once he saw that, he just told that officer everything that officer wanted to know. He wouldn't help me. I'm a, I actually had seniority on that officer. I, was, I had been in the department longer. Didn't matter. I did not meet his expectations. Jesus meets the expectations of the ancients. But you'd have to come in a certain window of time because all of those ancient myths are not worshipped that long into the common period the common era, A.D. So you'd have to come within, a, like, for example, Osiris has got, there's a limit when the Egyptian empire falls or is completely obliterated, then the gods of ancient Egypt are no longer being worshipped. So you have to come in the overlap when most of the ancient myths are being worshipped simultaneously. That means there's another window of opportunity which centers right in the first century that if you come and meet the expectations of the ancients, you'll have an explosive connection and explosive reaction. And this is exactly what Jesus does. So when anyone says, well, Jesus is, he's just a copy of ancient myths. Well, they are seeing what I'm seeing. He definitely embodies several common characteristics, but this is not to be leveraged against the reality of Jesus. This is what God leveraged for the reality of Jesus. So this is why I think it's actually not evidence against Jesus' historicity. It's actually evidence for. Yeah. But, you know, you did so much research for this book. I mean, there's a ton of information. If people, if people are, are, are wondering, is, is, is all of this real? I mean, you just read that book and you're like, you're, you're overwhelmed. And it's, it's sort of like you're saying enough already. <laughs> you convinced yeah. me. It's and a lot of what we're doing, honestly, Dr. Torres, when we're in front of um, juries, is we are trying to help them see the cumulative nature, the overwhelming cumulative nature of the case 
in a way that, that maybe they hadn't thought of before. So we're going to be looking at all kinds of evidence, not just, you know, I wrote a book on the evidence that's in the New Testament. That's cold case Christianity. So we definitely have good evidence in the New Testament. But in this book, I'm trying to offer this thought experiment to get people to look at the evidence that's outside the New Testament. When you put the whole thing together, the case for Jesus is overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. You talk about, and, 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 and you teach us about, about how to solve crimes. You talk about the prophetic views, and you talk about evidence that's clear versus evidence that's cloaked. Clear versus cloaked evidence. T yeah, tell us what you mean. Well, so, you know, I, I was never impressed with the prophecies that people would say, oh, there's over 300 prophecies of the Messiah that Jesus happens to meet. What are the odds that any one man in ancient history would ever match the 300 or so plus prop? I, I was never impressed with that approach uh, as a detective, especially as a guy. I was not a believer until I was 35. So when I first heard these kinds of claims, I was not a believer. So I would hear them and I would say, Look, well, show me the, the verses. Show me these these ancient prophecies. And as I read through the ancient prophecies in the Old Testament, a lot of them just seem like, now you're mistaking a couple of different forms of that. These are not clear. It's not like if you read this prophecy in real time, you know, five centuries before Jesus, would you even think this is got this, this prophet is even talking about the Messiah? Sometimes it seems like David's just talking about David. Like, why would you think he's talking about the Messiah? Well, it's because people have mis misunderstood the difference at crime scenes between clear and cloaked evidence. So if you have a, a well, in, we're getting better and better at this, especially with ancestry DNA. If you find DNA at a crime scene, you might even be able to identify the suspect before you ever meet that suspect, because that suspect will be uh, identified through his DNA if there's a sufficient DNA database. And that database is growing nationally and internationally. So that's clear. It'll Point, we used to do this from the old days with fingerprints. We've got a pretty decent fingerprint database here in California. We often could identify somebody in advance of meeting them just from the, the DNA. I mean, I'm sorry, the fingerprint evidence at a crime scene. So what we try to do is um, that's clear. That points to the uh, suspect from the onset before you ever knock on his door. But there's other evidence at the crime scene, like, for example, a torn piece of a shirt or a button that's on the crime scene floor. We're not even sure this belongs to the suspect or to the victim. We don't know who, but for all we know, it could have been lying there before the crime ever even occurred. It could just be an artifact of the scene and not even part of the crime. But it turns out if I knock on this guy's door, and I see he's got a torn shirt or he's got a button missing and it matches the one at the crime scene. Well, now that piece of evidence, which at the time was cloaked, now it is something we're going to use to identify and make the suspect. So we have two kinds of evidence at crime scene. One that identifies you from the onset, clear, and one that identifies you in hindsight, cloaked. Well, the same thing is true of prophecies. Many of these prophecies are clearly predicting a Messiah that who is to come. And even the Jews of today would say, oh, yeah, that that verse is messianic. That's referring to the Messiah to come. But there's a lot of verses that the New Testament authors use that are kind of like the button. They're saying, hey, this may not have been clear from the onset, but it's clearly like a button now that matches the shirt of Jesus and it identifies him after the fact. We would never say, well, you know, buttons at crime scenes are not legitimate evidence. No, we would say they're legitimate evidence, but you got to use them a certain way. Same thing is true of these of these verses. So I'm now much more receptive to how we could use verses because I think about them the way we think about evidence at a crime scene. Okay, good. And then, then how about this this perfect timing on on prophecy? That that there was you talk about this actually quite a lot. You talk about there's these prophecies, and then there's a there's a window of time where these prophecies converge upon and Jesus yeah. came right in, in in that narrow window of time. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if you look at the prop the so so one of the prophecies from Daniel, I think it's in chapter nine, sets the appearance of the Messiah between an edict to restore Jerusalem and uh, the destruction of the temple, whenever that's going to happen. Well, we know when the edict occurred, pretty much we got a couple of options there, and we know when the destruction of the temple occurred in 70 AD. So there's a window there. Again, another window of opportunity. Well, this is hard to describe. This is why I have over 400 illustrations in the book. The book, I hope, reads more like a graphic novel in the sense that I want people to go illustration to illustration. And when you see it, 
when you see the overlap, so a lot of what I'm describing is hard to, to visualize, but uh, if you see the overlap of the cultural fuse where that Pax Romana is in place, the overlap of the spiritual fuse where all of those ancient myths are being worshipped simultaneously, the overlap of the prophecy um, uh, fuse in which Daniel says he's going to come in that range of, of years. Well, when you put them all together, you only have a smaller window in which all three of the fuses are now lined up. So I could exist in the perfect fuse for the culture, the perfect fuse spiritually, and the perfect fuse opening for prophecy. That period of time is only about 100 years. It's from about 29 AD, uh, BC to about 70 AD. There's the window in which the fullness of time could be realized. If Jesus shows up in that window, then the story of Jesus is going to have feet on the roads that the Romans have provided, all the people groups will be uh, worshiping gods that they expect and sound similar to the real God who appears in history. And finally, the Messiah would come in the predicted time from Daniel. And sure enough, that's when Jesus arrives, right in the middle third of that hundred year period. So I think in the end, when I saw that, I was like, wow. I mean, if you didn't know anything about Jesus of Nazareth personally, no data from the New Testament. You could certainly understand from just the fuse that something big is about to happen. And that's one of the things we're looking at, at the fuse and fallout of history. You know, you, what you did in your book, and I really like this, is you took a story, which is an actual story about how you had solved a cold case crime where there was no body, nobody witnessed this, and it had happened a decade earlier, and how you, you ended up solving this, and spoiler alert, the guy ends up going to jail. And so you, you, you talk about this fuse, and you said, here is the window where the guy had to have killed his wife because you know, she was pregnant, she was about to do this, and because of this, and you, you talk about this fuse, and yes, your book is just full of, of, of pictures. I mean, it's, if, if you like pictures, as an organic chemist, I love pictures because it, it tells me things uh, much faster than words. And, and, and as I've seen your presentation, so I know that's true. So that's, that's very true. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's just f full of all this, this artwork. Did, did you draw those, by the way? Was yeah. That, so I, I was, before drawings? I was a detective, you know, I didn't know I was going to be, I didn't really think I was going to be an uh, in, in, as a detective, work as a detective. I was working as an architect in Santa Monica. I had a bachelor's degree in design, a master's degree in architecture. And, but my dad was a detective and then a sergeant at our agency. And I just, when I was working as an, as an architect, if I'm honest with you, I, I felt like uh, my wife and I were together already about eight or nine years. And I felt like it wasn't going to be the kind of job I could do a good job raising a family with and be a good husband because I, it's so obsessive. The kind of person I am, I'm, I'm pretty obsessive. And I knew that the creative side of that job, I would probably never come home. I would probably want, because if you can do 10 more hours and, and it's, it's going to reflect your design, it's your baby. If 10 more hours, it'll be a better design. Are you going to give it the 10 more hours? Of course you are. Are you going to get paid for those 10 hours? No, you're not. So I just knew it was time to make a shift. And so I went into the work of my father, but I, yeah, I, I started off as a designer, as an artist. Okay. So I get to now, this is about the only way I get to exercise those skills. Is well, that, 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 that explains it. it. It's, 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 it's filled with this. And I, I don't know if you know, I'll mention this, that I was, I wanted to be a New York state trooper. Uh, oh, wow. But I, I'm colorblind, so I couldn't get into the academy at the time. And so I was going to go into forensic science, and then I took chemistry, and then I fell in love with organic chemistry. And yeah, awesome. Route. Whenever I hear you say that, because because I always think that, you know, my son a, was a biochemist, and then he became an anesthesiologist, and my, my second son. And when he was an O-chem, like everyone knows in med school, like O-chem is like, like nobody wants to take that class. Like who in the world? takes an old chem class and says, oh, I love, that was my favorite class. I think you're the only person I, I've well, never heard well, talk about it. I'll, I'll tell you, it's digital. Either you love it or you hate it. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's sort of like Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're not. Um, but, but you talked about also this, this um, dissemination fallout, the unfounded fiction that just, just so much written about Jesus versus other people. I mean, this is God come on the scene. 
Yeah. And, and it, it's so obvious when you look at the overwhelming amount of, of information and you relate this to, for example, Elvis Presley. And, and yeah. uh, uh, tell us about this. Well, I picked Elvis because Elvis, uh, back when I was younger, um, high school, he, he passed away when I was in high school. And um, I remember, uh, I, I think I might have just graduated high school. Uh, but anyway, but I remember at the time, it was a big deal. And people like my mom were just devastated. And yeah, this the, guy had- The, the had, king is dead. That's the king what is the dead. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. You know, and, and we used to call him the king. Uh, and, and for a lot of people, maybe now they don't, I mean, a book has been written about Elvis, at least one book, Every year since he died, and sometimes like as many as eight books have been written in a calendar year about Elvis Presley, and they fall in different groups, people who loved him, people who didn't love him, people who knew him, people who didn't know him. And if Elvis can have this kind of impact based on all the records he said, wouldn't you expect something similar at least for Jesus of Nazareth? Well, it turns out that's exactly what we see in all the same kinds of categories that you see people who knew him, people who didn't know him, people who loved him, people who didn't love him. And you see these different categories. As a matter of fact, you're right. No one has been written about, no historical figure has been written about more than Jesus of Nazareth. That's true even today. You can search the Library of Congress. You can even search Google Books. There's no other historical figure who has been written about more. As a matter of fact, it's not just in terms of the nonfiction books that have been written. It's in terms of fiction. It's in terms of even characters like Neo on Matrix, or you can name any number. I've got a list of them in the book. It's in the appendix of people who um, were designed after the broad story of Jesus. His story is so compelling that there's an entire genre of fictional characters in the history of literature known as Christ figures. No screenplays have been written more than Jesus. And from all of this written data, if you didn't have a New Testament, you have to destroy literally millions and millions of not just now the titles, but remember every time a story, this is why Jesus comes when he comes. Why don't you think about this for a second? Could you imagine? It's been said to me, well, no, it would have been smarter for God to send Jesus in this generation because look, we have this video. We have all this stuff we're doing on YouTube. We could communicate. Them. Oh, really? Really? Do you actually think that anyone trusts what they watch on video anymore? I mean, I mean, people are going to listen to what we're saying and they're going to, I mean, trust is a hard thing to come by in a social media age. Not only that, whoever watches this video is not likely to download it into their home. They're going to watch it from the server. Now, what's interesting about books is that every time you sell a book or a book is copied, there's a physical geographic location that, where that book is occupying. It. So, so now it's much harder so 100,000 views of a, of, a, of a video do not have the historic impact of 100,000 printed copies of a book that exists all over the globe. That's much harder to destroy. And that's why now there are literally millions and millions and millions of volumes of books in which the data about Jesus exists. And they're not New Testaments. They're the things that people have written about Jesus. And because they are so, he's been written about more than anyone else in the history of historical figures, there is more data that can be recollected, reconstructed about the Jesus story than there is for any other historical care. As a matter of fact, think about it. We have a record. Let's say you had a record of um, um, Tiberius Caesar or, or Nero. You have, there's another guy who lived in the first century, ruled a nation, so Nero. Well, just take every piece of data you have about Nero. You will not be able to reconstruct it from history if the foundational documents were removed. But you can remove the foundational gospels. And guess what? There are movies uh, created in the last decade in which every word of the gospels was part of the, was the screenplay. The gospels were the screenplay. Who out, what other historical figure can have every known word ever uttered, uttered by this person mm -hmm. is now a part of a screenplay or a, a book. Or This is the crazy thing about Jesus' story is that so much of it has been reiterated by others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, this was all new to me, but you, you think about it. This is God come in the flesh, and he left a witness just printed yes. all over. And it, it, it's just there. And then you talk about the imagination fallout, the art, music, architecture, film, screenplay. He's just everywhere, everywhere. And, and you even said you can just look at stained glass in churches all over the world and you see the story of, of the birth and life of Jesus 
And this is what you're talking about. Get rid of the New Testament and you still have the story of Jesus. It's all there. Uh, yeah, I know we're short of a time. It's impossible to cover the depth. I mean, Frank Turk, a friend of ours, uh, is an apologist. He said to me, why don't you write 10 books? Because there's 10 chapters here that there's no way you're going to be able to deep dive all these chapters. I said, well, you're right. But I just, I just think that <laughs> I'm lucky I get a chance to write one book, okay, with Zoner, but not let alone 10. So let me just write one book. But you're right. The history of, of literature, art, music, education, uh, science, and world religions – uh, have been so deeply impacted by the person of Jesus that, yes, all of these in most unexpected uh, ways, on education, for example, if you just looked at the top 15 universities in the world today, they were all founded by Christ followers. That's not a list of Christian universities. That's just the list of anyone's list of top 10 universities in the world. Well, I've looked at all of them. It ends up with about 15 in overlap. So 50, they're all founded by Christ followers. And if you went and visited those campuses, guess what you would learn about? Because they keep their old buildings. They like their old buildings. And those old buildings where they first taught classes are replete with images, scriptures, engravings of Jesus of Nazareth. The story of Jesus can be reconstructed constructed just from the campuses and the charters of the top 15 universities today. As a matter of fact, 75 of the top 100 universities in the world were founded by Christ followers. As a matter of fact, Christ followers have founded more modern universities than any and every other group combined. Now, just think about that for a second. The reason why the scientific revolution is dominated by Christ followers, I mean dominated in a ridiculous way, is because they, for the most part, came out of the universities that Christians founded. Now, you could say, well, yeah, but look, if, if it's in Europe in the 16th and 17th century, come on, everyone's a Christian in Europe in the 16th and 17th century. Well, yeah, but there were more people outside of Europe who were not Christians that could have initiated the sciences but didn't. There were far more people in Asia. But why is it the sciences are born and the modern disciplines of science are founded by Christ followers during this period of time more than any other period of time? It's in what we call Christendom in a rich teaching uh, worldview. For the, initiated by Jesus, who doesn't tell his disciples, you know, go out and make converts. No, he says, go out and make disciples, teaching them what I have. He inaugurated a teaching culture that ultimately blossomed into the sciences. And this is something that's very unique to the Christian worldview. And while others have also participated in this, no one has dominated Nobel Prize laureates. No one has dominated uh, winners of scientific awards or founders and fathers of scientific disciplines like Christians have. Do you think our kids know that? No, they don't know that. As a matter of fact, they think in order to be a science, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to abandon my Christian beliefs, abandon my view of miracles, abandon my view of the resurrection. Well, the history of science says something different, and we have to make a decision for this generation in 2021, 2022, make a decision. Do we want our kids to pursue the sciences? I hope we raise up all of our kids to pursue the sciences. We need to own the things that a Christian worldview gave birth to, and one of those is the sciences. It's wonderful. This is music to my ears. Now, tell me, what is it about Christianity? What is it about God being distinct from his material creation, which allows us to worship God and study his creation and look at it as something that's consistent. If he had been a willy-nilly God and, and made, yeah. for example, every biological system different, we never could come up with medicines. It's because of the consistency of God and his consistency as he lays out in the scriptures that, that we have something to put our are, are hook into and study. Oh, it's absolutely true. There's, I think I find like seven, six or seven different catalysts, igniters for sciences based on a Christian worldview. And one of them is simply, if you look at the pantheon of gods that precede Yahweh, that precede the Judeo-Christian idea about God and Jesus incarnate, if you look at that pantheon of gods, they are pretty vile. I mean, they have certain common characteristics that are divine, but many 
most have also a set of fallen characteristics in which they are drunken, debaucherous cheaters who are stealing the wives and spouses of, of humans and committing murders and all kinds of terrible acts. Whenever they're depicted in the pantheon of gods, they're depicted as drunken partiers at a table without any clothes on. And if this is the nature of the divine realm, okay, why would we expect in a, in a disorderly bunch of gods there to be order anywhere else? But if the world around us is the product of a single, rational, orderly God who has designed us in his image, why would we even think we have the rational ability to examine the world rationally? It's because we're created in the image of a single, orderly God who is not, um, he, he is, he's not detached, but he is, he is distinct from his creation. It's not like we can say, well, what causes this current in the ocean? It must be Poseidon is mad today. Well, why would there be lightning on the skies today? Well, it must be that Zeus is angry about something. Look, if, if that's the case, we, we can't really study. What's the point in studying any phenomena? It's all just the direct interaction of gods who are not distinct from the creation. On the other hand, if God is distinct from his creation and is rational and orderly, we would expect that his fingerprints would be rational and orderly, something that we can discover with our rational, orderly minds since we are created in his image. This is not an example. One of the things that struck me is, is if you were to look at history, and I just said I'm, I'm investigating timelines, timelines of the fuse and the timelines of the fallout. So in every single chapter, I start off my research by asking the question, what is the timeline of biblical prophecy? What is the timeline of education? What is the timeline of science? Okay, well, do that timeline. You'll see when the foundational philosophies of science are established in antiquity. You'll see when natural philosophers appear on the scene and it's pretty static, pretty static. And then suddenly you'll see this natural philosophy blossom into observable, testable science. And then you have the scientific revolution evolution, all this explosion of activity. Well, where do you think Jesus stands in that historic timeline? Right before the explosion. Now, is that just a coincidence? That's what I needed to know. By the way, it could have been a thousand years earlier when all that nothing was happening. But no, he's actually right before the explosion. Well, it's because there's something about the Christian worldview that is the igniter for the explosion. And this is, this is just the nature. Look, for example, one simple thing too. Um, you know, I've all, we've all had, I had a, a, a structural engineering when I was in architecture, we had to do three years of structural engineering, you know, two, two years of calculus, then you're in a structural engineering for three years. I had a, a professor, his name was Bupendra Singhal. He was geeked out on structural engineering. He loved it. And there's lots of good teachers who are just geeked out on their topic. But Christians took it another level higher. They weren't just interested in the topic. They actually saw their work in the field as an act of worship, of devotion. In other words, all the intensity and passion that we would sometimes we often reserve for God. Scientists historically, Christian scientists have historically um, uh, um, exercised in their work as an act of devotion and worship. This is why people would, Kepler says that we were just thinking God's thoughts after him. Well, this is something very different and it raises the bar in a way that simply cannot, I mean, there's things that you and I will do that are risky, that have no monetary value, but we think they are acts of devotion that God has called us to perform. We all do this. This is why Christians typically serve, adopt more, uh, do all the things that, are, that, that cost us something because we think, hey, this is what God wants of us. Well, if you look at your scientific exploration in the same way, well, you are liable to do it at a whole nother level that nobody else can rival. And that's what you see historically with Christians who are working yeah. in the sciences. And, and, you know, if you, if you ask people very often about science and faith, and they will grab hold of the story of Galileo, and they'd say, look, the church tried to stop him. But you actually, and as many people have, have told the true story of what was going on. Galileo had done some things that really upset the Pope, although the Pope was a big supporter of his before that. And yep. so you, you, really, you really put that story in, in a correct light. And this is one incident, but the incidents, but net, incident, and then you go through and you talk about all the historic uh, scientists that are there that are believers in Jesus Christ that have affected their field for good and science. So there is not this dichotomy between science and faith. I mean, the greatest scientists have, have latched onto this. And this isn't even understood in the academy. 
here in the university, yeah. the vast majority of professors today don't even understand this. They think that Christian is foolishness. And you were, you were very candid about yourself. You had the same view. You yeah. thought that the, the Christians must be dumb, they're anti-science. Right. Right. And then it was these sorts of investigations that changed your view. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. I think that's, and I do worry about that going forward for our own kids. I think sometimes if we just gotten to the point where we, everything is politics and then politics is like, I don't want my faith, my religious uh, faith, my theistic beliefs to be entirely politicized. And I also don't want science to become politicized and I don't want politics to become theism where people treat politics as though it's their, their God. Mm -hmm. In the end, I think that's part of what's dividing us and what maybe the wedge Right, the, the, the age of vaccinations and and uh, divergent views on whether we should be vet all that stuff. I get that it almost feels like well, if you are trying to use you're trying to weaponize science against our view, then and I see some Christians doing this, like they see that the, that the wedge issue has now become science. So therefore, we're not going. Christians can't embrace that's that's the tool of the enemy. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That, that's that is this. This is simply the fingerprints of God in His creation. Who better to be looking for the fingerprints of God in His creation than people who actually believe there's a God? I mean, I mean this is what gets me. We cannot listen. What I discovered in all that research about um, natural philosophers and scientists over the ages is that a, another huge contributor to the sciences for a window of period of time, which they call the golden age of Islam, was Islam. They contributed greatly from about the 7th century to about the 13th century, maybe. That's the golden age of Islam. But then their in interaction in the sciences drops off. Mm -hmm. And and why? Well, for largely theological reasons. Mm -hmm. Look, folks, we can make the same mistake. We ought not make that mistake. We ought to remember that we have had, look, in the end, our culture is shaped it's not by politics. It's never been shaped by politics. That's way too far downfield. Let me tell you how culture is shaped. Literature, art, music, education, and science. The five things I talk about in this book that Christians have owned historically. If you surrender those five things, then you're just following everyone else's version of culture because it turns out that what we talk about in the arts and literature and music and in education, that's the stuff that the next generation assumes that becomes their baseline so we have to innovate in the arts in literature in music in education and in science because that's how the future culture is going to be shaped so i just i hate to see us surrender that's why i think jesus does still matter that's why i wanted i got about halfway through this book and you know typically publishers see who you are as a detective and they want the subtitle to be something like you know a cold case detective does this blah 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 I said, no, this subtitle needs to be very, very specific. This is why Jesus still matters in a world that rejects the Bible. Because you may not think Christianity is true, but the stuff that you think is true, the stuff that you think is important, if you're like me as an atheist, it was those things. It was, you know, science, education, art, literature, and music. It turns out those are standing on the shoulders of Jesus and his followers. We cannot tell surrender those. Those tell things me matter. Tell me about health care, hospitals. Yeah, and I, I put this in the science chapter. And to be honest, Dr. Tour, I, I could have done a whole chapter just on, on, on health care. But here's why I, I didn't separate it out. Um, no one's done more in terms of health care and, and serving the poor. We have a, a master who set as his example when he was with us the, the, the care for those who were deaf and blind and lepers and people who were sick and raising the dead. I mean, no one is the, the great physician more than Jesus of Nazareth. And that example has been followed by his disciples every, every generation after Jesus. Now, I could easily have shown the huge unparalleled impact that Jesus and his followers have had on medical care. It would have been absolutely overwhelming. But um, I wanted to do two things with each one of these chapters. Number one, show his impact. Number two, be able to reconstruct the story of Jesus from the impact. Now, here's what's interesting. There are some of the oldest hospitals in the history of hospitals 
uh, were founded by Christians. But because uh, medical technology changes, those buildings get torn down, rebuilt, torn down, rebuilt because they're constantly changing and shifting. Now they've got surgical rooms. Now they've got surgical centers. Now we're doing chemotherapy of a certain nature. Now we've changed this to radiation. So the, the facilities are always changing. So you might have a site in Europe in which the oldest hospital that ever has been built formed by Christians is still at that location, but it's now in its 20th building. And, and it's unlike universities that love their old buildings because they show the prestige of the university. They keep their old buildings with all of those images of Jesus. This isn't always true for hospitals. So what I did was took the physicians who wrote about Jesus and who are the fathers and mothers of these scientific disciplines like radiology, the inventor of the MRI, the inventor of the x-ray. These are all Christians. And I simply put those folks in the science chapter because th those, those writings now still tell us. But unlike the universities, the hospital buildings go away. And so it's hard to reconstruct the story of Jesus from the but even hospitals. Even with that, though, you talk yes. about how, how uh, Christians have started more hospitals <laughs> by far than any other non-governmental organizations That's combined. Right. I mean, well, I want you to look at it this way. Look at just education for a second. Buddhism has got a pretty big head start on Christianity. Right. Hinduism, huge head start on Christianity. Look at the number of facilities, educational facilities even, modern universities founded by those two groups. Put them all together. They're 10 times smaller than the number of universities founded by Christians. There's just a, it's a worldview that is grounded in a teaching principle. If you want to raise up disciples and teach them about Jesus, that means you're going to be using the book. We are people of the book. We're going to be teaching people the book. Oh, but they don't read. Well, okay, we're going to have to teach you how to read. Oh, but we don't have an alphabet. Well, we're going to have to create an alphabet and then teach you how to read. And it turns out that process of teaching, we're also going to teach you how to care for yourself. We're going to teach you vocations. We're going to do. So we end up with this huge uh, multi-generational teaching culture that starts very early. As a matter of fact, of the oldest books in Christendom, you have the four gospels. One of the next oldest books you have in all of Christendom. Christendom is a book called the Didache or the teaching of the 12 disciples to the nations. And this is a book that was used simply to catechize new Christians. One of the very first books in Christendom is a book that's used to teach young Christians. This is the kind of culture that Jesus established. So why would you be surprised then that monasteries, then cathedral schools, then uh, universities are reflecting this worldview? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and what you had also mentioned is how... how um, Jesus is affected across faiths. He's mentioned in different faiths. He's, and he didn't take on the image of other faiths. He was who he was. He didn't That's say, right. he, 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 he spoke from himself. He said this, but now everyone following him has tried to incorporate him into, the, into what was going on. Yeah, if you're a he religious... Yeah, if you're a religion that began after Jesus, like Islam or Ahmadiyya, uh, Ahmadiyya uh, Islam, Ahmadiyya Muslims, for example, or Baha'i, or uh, even like New Age believers that are more harder to kind of nail down the set of beliefs, or Hare Krishna, whatever it may be. If mm -hmm. you come after Jesus, you are going to probably incorporate Jesus. He's on your holy pages of your scripture, as he is in the Quran, as he is in the writing of Baha'u'llah, that the master behind the Baha'i faith. But what's interesting is even in those worldviews that preceded Jesus, Hinduism, Buddhism, the worship of Addis and Mithras and Heracles, these uh, religions modified or mention Jesus in some way. Their, their leaders will venerate Jesus and, and say that, hey, under Buddhism, there's a place for Jesus as a, as, a, as a wise, enlightened teacher on his way to Buddhahood. There are, in other words, uh, each system says, you know what, we, Jesus is it's, it's okay over here. We, we like Jesus over here. We, we see the value in Jesus over here. Meanwhile, Jesus never returned the favor. He comes after Indra and Hinduism and Buddhism and Addis and Heracles and Mithras. Yet he never says, he says instead, I am the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't return the favor to anyone else. Yet everyone else, if you're in those, those I actually show in the book a map, maps of the places in the world 
where Hindus know something about Jesus from their leaders. Buddhists know something about Jesus from their leaders. Muslims know something about Jesus from their scripture. Baha'is know something about Jesus from their scripture. Ahmadi Muslims know something about Jesus from their scripture. Here's my point is you can reconstruct the outline of the Jesus story from non-Christian religions. You can't reconstruct the story of Buddha in the New Testament. Right. No, as a matter of fact, Jesus is very exclusive in what he yeah. says, yes. which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, there might be two people named J. Warner Wallace in my town. But if you want this one, the directions to the other guy's house are not going to get you here. It's only one set of directions. Now, you might come out from a number of different ways, but this is the house where you have to land, ultimately. Good. And then if you said, well, yeah, but will any J. Warner Wallace do? Well, if the other guy is a different age and different profession and a different background than I am, but you're looking for the cold case detective, J. Warner Wallace, well, then this one is going to have to be the one that's your target. Mm -hmm. And so why would you be surprised that if there is a God – a singular God, that there be a certain way to get to his house. And only, although even somebody else might even bear the same name, but it, it may not be the one you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think in the end, the fact that Jesus is very particular and exclusive shows his high regard for the truth, because that is the nature of objective truth. Okay, let me ask you one, one final question before I begin to wrap this up. So in your book, Person of Interest, you have a little section on this, and I want you to help us out here. As a Jew, I found this fascinating. Why is it that Jews don't accept this, if it's so obvious? Why is it that Jews don't accept Jesus as the Messiah? Well, I will just tell you that, think about it. Um, every worldview, well, there's, first of all, there's three reasons why anyone accepts or denies a truth claim. I mean, sometimes it is rational. Sometimes you just say there's not enough evidence for this. And for people like that, we want to spend some time providing the evidence for why we think this is true, because they just think there's not enough evidence. But that's a very small percentage, if you ask me, of deniers of any, any claim. The other sets of deniers are people who are emotional deniers. They're not rational. It's emotional. They've had a bad experience with the Christians. They do not want to bend their knee. I you know my dad was a pastor and he was a jerk. I've heard this kind of story. So therefore, I want nothing to do with this. Well, that's not about the evidence for or against something. That's just about your response to an experience you had. That's more emotional. But then there's the third group, which I actually think is the largest group. Um, of anybody who denies a truth claim, and that are not rational, not emotional. They are volitional deniers. They don't want it to be true because I want you to think about before I was a Christian, I had a God in my life. His name was Jim Wallace. I got to choose everything I wanted to do. I never had to bet. You ask me, how am I doing? I'm doing great. How do I know? Ask me. I'm the only judge of what's great in my life. I, I, in other words, it's really easy to throw the, the, the dart against the wall and then just go, go draw the bullseye wherever the dart lands. That's what I was doing for 35 years. I got to set my own bullseye. I always hit it. But now there's a bullseye before I start, and I didn't draw it, and I can never get close to it because the bullseye is the perfection of Jesus. So there's a lot of denial that I think is more about, do, am I willing to bend my knee? Now, when it comes to Jewish believers looking, well, number one, I think that there's two things there I see. Uh, number one, they typically will interpret those verses to mean something about the nation of Israel rather than a single person, or their expectation is for a Messiah that is really going to restore the power of the nation of Israel. And the saving that they're thinking about is a military saving. It's a governmental saving. It's a power saving. It's not a spiritual saving that Jesus provides. So I think that's part of it. But I want you to also consider the idea that I know this because I got Mormons in my family. Any view that says, if I simply do these things, whether they be the Ten Commandments, whether they be the principles of Mormonism, wherever they may be, then I can save myself with my own good works. That's a very powerful drive on the part of humans that allows well, us to separate from other people yeah. who aren't doing that. And I think a lot of us um, if you're telling me that anyone has access to this salvation, uh, even though I've lived a certain way my whole life, you're telling me that I'll be oh, no more saved than the person who's lived like a bum and now today truly repents and gives his life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks who just can't stomach that opportunity. Grace is difficult to swallow. Like Simon, when Jesus goes to Simon's house 
and the woman is now bathing Jesus' feet in her in, 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 and he says and Simon says if, if he knew who that was he wouldn't let her touch him mm -hmm. and he knows Simon's thoughts and he says Simon she knows how much she needs to be forgiven for you didn't even wash my feet when I came in he who does not think he has to anything for which to be forgiven is the least forgiving. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with workspace faiths is that we often think we've earned it. And we're not gracious to those who we don't think have earned it. The well, same I, way I, Simon was not gracious. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's interesting. It's a, and and uh, what I've seen as a Jew is one is exactly as you've said. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, that they tried to pursue it by works and not by faith, that they thought they could get this. The other thing is that Jews are taught against Jesus. From a very young age, the rabbis teach them against Jesus. So it is much easier to share with somebody from communist China about mm -hmm. Jesus than it is with a Jew because they've, they've, they've been taught against Jesus. I wanna, I wanna close out by reading some excerpts from your book. Okay. So people can get, an idea here of, of, of the power of this thing. And so you, you, you say, you say uh, why then did Jesus have more impact than anyone else? Jesus was born in a tiny irrelevant town in, a Roman, in the Roman Empire and raised in another small village. He had to walk from, place, from one place to the next. As an adult, he never traveled more than 200 miles from the town where he was born. He had none of the resources people use today to make an impact. No social media platform, no podcast audience, no clever videos, no website. He didn't even have the resources used in the first century to make an impact. He never held a political office. He never ruled a nation. He never led an army. He never authored a book. His family was insignificant. The locals suspected he was an illegitimate son. His mother was a poor peasant woman. His father couldn't afford much. Jesus didn't receive any expensive education, never married, never had children, never owned a home of his own, and he didn't possess much more than the clothes on his back. As an adult, his own brother was suspicious of his ministry a work that ended after just three short years. Public opinion turned against him. Most of his followers abandoned him. One disciple betrayed him. Another denied him. He was rejected by the religious, hunted by the powerful, mocked and unjustly persecuted by his enemies. He suffered an unfair trial, was publicly humiliated, brutally beaten and unduly executed in the most horrific way. Even then, the few followers who remained had to borrow a grave to bury him. Yet this is the man who changed history, inaugurated the common era, and forever transformed the most important and revered aspects of human culture. How is it possible that a single man, a man like Jesus, could have this impact? I mean, if that doesn't just underscore that this is God come in the flesh, you go on to say he matters because he inspired more literature than any other person in history, more books, more screen, scripts, more screenplays. He matters because he was the catalyst for visual arts, inspiring painters, sculptors in every generation, genre, style, and nation. He matters because he's been the topic of more songs, hymns, symphonies than any other figure in history. He matters because his teaching set a standard for moral reform and initiated a worldview that led to the flourishing of education. He matters because he established a worldview that encouraged exploration and motivated, motivated his followers to investigate the natural revelation of God, resulting in an explosion of scientific discovery. He matters because his influence on spiritual seekers and religious thinkers is so overwhelming that every major world religion either mentions or merges him into their theology. Jesus had that kind of impact, the impact we would expect from God. The fuse and the fallout of the common era simply confirm the existence and deity of Jesus as described in the New Testament. That is a summation, Jim, of, 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 of this book by uh, a person of interest by J. Warner Wallace. I would, I would uh, uh, really encourage you to take a look at this. If you have, if you have uh, uh, students, if you have young people going to college, show them this book to give them ammunition because there is so much documented in here, so many pieces. He doesn't just say, a lot of scientists believe. He just give, li gives lists of them. He gives list after list. And some people may say, wow, it was just, just overwhelming. Yes, and it's, it's what you need. It's what we need to equip our young people. It's what we need to people, 
need for people to see that God has come to this earth and he has affected human history. This is a tremendous book. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Tour. I can't tell you how much respect I have for you. You are one of the uh, only couple of people I reached out to who are scientists who I wanted to endorse the book. So I really appreciate your work, as you know, and your endorsement of this book. Oh, thank you. And God bless you, my friend. You too, brother. Thank you. Okay, Eric, I oh, think that's awesome. a take, huh? I mean, this is powerful. I mean, the way you ended that book, I mean, I just read that over and over again. I mean, it's, it's just exciting. It's just exciting. Well, I appreciate and, uh, you saying it. I feel like um, it's one of those things, too, is if you, there's not a single example anywhere in history of a fictional character who's done this. That's why I think this is a good, good way to look at it and say, well, then it's reasonable to infer he's not a fictional character. Because what, what's the example of anybody else who's done that? But it's also true that there's not a single mortal who's done that, had that kind of impact on history. So that's a reasonable inference that he's not a mortal. There's mm -hmm. something about Jesus that I think you can make a case for the historicity and idea of Jesus from. But but I'll, I just don't, like there's several books back here that I have used, you know, to research this book. They're just about the impact of Jesus, but they don't try to make a case for his deity from that impact. And that's where I thought that I wanted to go that extra step. Mm -hmm. So you know, this, I appreciate you. I hope a lot of work. You know, yeah, most Christian books to me these days, most Christian books written today seem to me like they've been written in two weeks because they have. Yeah. But yours, obviously, this is years of, of gathering. It was, it was two years. Yeah, it was two years from 19. From, it was two years. And they gave me two years to build it. And I, I had two research assistants and I just had given them strict instructions. You know, like one guy, his only job was to go through about 950 scientists I sent him and tell me, because I knew they were fathers of the disciplines, mm -hmm. what are they the father of? What's their denomination? Where did they live? What was their discipline? And get them in the actual correct order with the dates of birth and death. <laughs> that, that project took that poor guy about two months just to, to get those, because it's so hard to find data. And mm -hmm. I know we didn't get all the church, all the uh, science fathers, mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of these uh, biographies that you find online or in books, they don't talk about their religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. So then you're like going, okay, so as uh, Joe Smith, okay, he was a biochemist. Okay, well, great. So now I'm looking up Joe Smith, biochemist, Christian, Joe, I'm, look, I'm looking, doing Google searches, yeah. Jewish, like trying to figure out like, you know, where. So the groups that are the most impactful are not just Christians. Yeah, a lot of Christians, but there's a lot of Christians historically, mm -hmm. but Jews actually way outnumber per capita. So oh, if you oh, look yeah. at like, like yeah, yeah. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Sciences, about 30% yeah. are Jewish. That's not 30% yeah, yeah. of the population yeah, yeah. is not yeah. Jewish. Yeah, yeah. It, it's something like 25% of Nobel Prize winners, yet the Jewish population in the world is is uh, uh, about one percent? Yeah, not even one percent. Yeah, that's why I think that's the more remarkable. Yeah. That's the more remarkable yeah. achievement. But if you look at the Judeo-Christian worldview, it's up in the you know about eighty percent of all prizes. Mm -hmm. Again, this is changing, and my fear is that I don't. I, this is why I wanted the chapter to have your your picture in it, uh, because I wanted. This is not just a discussion of dead guys. There's a sense in which, oh, yeah, you're talking about dead guys. No, no, actually, I'm not talking about dead guys. Yeah. We are still in the sciences, but I get it. This does start to feel like it's we're now such a small minority. Yeah. But if you can include the, the sciences of medical sciences, I think the numbers are much higher for us. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, it, it's been said that that there are plenty of academics that have the intellectual chops of C.S. Lewis and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but they have not the impact because they're cowards. It's yeah. because what we see in the academy is that the, the, you see that we're utter cowards. They will not speak up about the Lord. They will not take a, a defensive position to defend the faith. And you see, they did this in Nazi Germany. They did yeah. this with the Soviets. They went yeah. right along with the government because they wanted to hunker down, thinking it wasn't going to affect them. They wanted to get their accolades. They wanted to get their awards. Yeah. Because what happens is in the sciences, and I, and I know this firsthand, they exclude you from the academies. They exclude mm -hmm. you from awards. And so people don't want to speak up. I have people coming to me saying they watch the videos on Origin of Life. They say, Jim, you had everything. Everything right. Yeah. We agree with you, but don't tell them. Don't use my name. 
It's cowards. It's utter yeah. cowards. And because of that, they don't affect their generation. And the reason why C.S. Lewis, why, why, uh, um, why, why Dietrich Bonhoeffer affected their generation is because they stood up to this. Bold, yeah. Let me offer you one last thing. I know you're tight for time, so I'm just going to offer one last thing. I was listening to a, a sociologist from China. And here's what they said. They said, you know, um, Christianity is growing in China under, underground in such a pace that they thought, they predicted that by 2030, that China would have 250 million Christians, making it the largest Christian nation on planet Earth. Now, I want you just to think about that for a second. What I see in China is a conservative values related to family, sexual identity, gender, um, biblical masculinity. They don't, they're not biblical, but it's very much like the biblical versions of these things. They are more and more conservative. Their concern is that, 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 that they don't want beta males in China. They want alpha males in China. So they hold to traditional values. Now, in that same country is this movement of conservatism that no one talks about, which is Christianity. At some point, it's going to bump heads with the, the power structure. But isn't it interesting that it turns out that the most conservative nation in the world in the next 30 years might end up being a Christian nation called China? I mean, that's mind blowing, isn't it? It, it, it? it is amazing. And I have thought the same thing that the Christian community might change that country. You know, I, I, I try to never go a week without leading somebody to Jesus. One on one, yeah. I saw you're doing that. That's do you get? I mean, do you get overwhelmed with requests? I, I get a lot of requests, but uh, um, uh, for those, I get a lot of requests from Christians, and so I weed those out. I say, if you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, yeah. it's not for you. But I mean, there's just a woman just at noon today. She's in. She's a 65 year old woman in Helsinki, and, uh, and and she came to the Lord in tears, just in tears. And uh, um, uh, this, it's it's the second person. And then there was a, there was another one uh, uh, just yesterday, just just on Sunday. So today's Monday, and one today. But the most, m the easiest people to lead to the Lord are the Chinese. The Chinese are the easiest. They are so accepting of this. I see them one day after another after another. The Chinese are coming to the Lord. If 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 I have Why a webcast or something, it's filled up with Chinese. Why do you think that is? Uh. uh I don't know, but I'll give you a guess, is that the okay. Chinese tried to throw, throw God out of China. They tried to just say, none of this. And God is saying, okay, I'll get you. And he's just reacting back because mm -hmm. what God does is he says, you want to throw my children in, in, into, into the, the Nile River? I'm going to drown your whole army in the yeah. Red Sea. I'm, yeah. I'm going to get you back in spades. And this yeah. is what God seems to do. He says, you didn't give the, the rest to the land. I'm going to put you in, in Babylon for 70 years and give that land 70 years of rest. You didn't take care of the poor. I'm going to put you in Babylon where you are a, a refugee and you're going to be poor. You, 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 wanted, yeah. I, you wanted to worship idols. I'm going to put you in Babylon where there's more idols than any other place in the world. And so God is just saying, you want to throw me out? I'm just going to give you Christians till it's coming out of your teeth. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. My gosh. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising. But if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible. And you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation. And there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.